Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Ekman with Gold Derby, and I'm here with Polly Morgan, the cinematographer from A Quiet Place Part Two. And Polly, you actually didn't work on the first movie. You've come aboard on the sequel. And I'm curious what it's like uh, jumping in on a sequel where a visual language has sort of already been established on the first movie. So how do you sort of work to put your own unique stamp on that? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the I loved the first movie um, and I thought Charlotte did such a beautiful job with it. So I was a little bit intimidated to take over from her. Um, but, you know, like like you said, it had a really strong visual language. They shot it on film. Um, they used anamorphic lenses. Obviously, we carried that look through. Um, and, you know, even though it was a sequel, because the family then kind of left the farmhouse and the themes of the movie were slightly different than the first one, in a way, it just kind of um, grew to have a little bit more of a life of its own. And so just inherently from the storytelling aspects of it, there were different things that we did that the first movie um, didn't do just inherently because of what the characters were experiencing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was definitely nerve wracking for sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, and, you know, John Krasinski, who wrote and directed this, and I've talked to a few other folks from the movie, and it seems like John is so uh, detailed and thought through in the way he crafted the story and the script. Um, so what was it what was it like working with him as a collaborator? Does he have very strong ideas of what he wants everything to look like? Yeah, I mean, it was amazing because um, unlike the first movie, he wrote this one and it was very much a blueprint for how he wanted the movie to be shot. And um, even when we first had a conversation about it, you know, I, I sort of um, remarked on the fact that it was such a visual script and the way that he described the, the scenes and the action um, and because there's not a massive amount of dialogue in the movie, um, the way that the words kind of describe the scenes um, pretty much was how the movie turned out. Um, so yeah, he was very prepared and um, he was very impressive with sort of how he wanted to execute the movie. Um, and even though, you know, um, both him and I and our operator, Matt Moriarty, um, on sets always, you know, things kind of just, you know, end up having a life of their own, mainly because of time. Um, but, you know, he really had a strong vision from the outset. Yeah. When, when you are thinking of, of your visuals for a movie, do you go back to like other films that are of a similar genre for references or where do you sort of gain your inspiration? Yeah, it's really interesting because I think it depends on what the project is. Um, this was a strange one, like you said, because it was a sequel and, um, you know, the film picks up right after where the first one left off. So I couldn't really, you know, go and dig up lots of references that kind of came to mind and show them to John because, you know, I really wanted it to be streamlined from the first movie. Um, but, you know, sometimes like the movie I'm on currently, we looked at a lot of um, paintings and, and artwork from the time periods. Um, and then sometimes it's other movies and sometimes it can be, you know, just like music or something completely left field. Yeah. Well, I would like to dive in a little bit with you to that opening prologue uh, sequence because it is filled with a ton of really great long shots uh, strung together that are very impressive, uh, particularly the, the ones in the car are the ones that are standing out to me right now. Where did that concept come from and how did you, how did you execute that in the car? Yeah, I mean, really, you know, it's very much just like it was um, in the script. Um, and I think not only was it kind of described that way, and again, when I first had the conversations with John, you know, that was one of the things that we brought up. And he mentioned to me that he kind of saw it like children of men in that he really wanted to be very sort of subjective with the characters and he didn't want to be outside the car seeing it. He wanted to be inside the car and experience it um, with the family's like point of view. So, you know, we basically used the approach that they used on Children of Men as our kind of um, starting off point, and then we just developed it from there. And um, it was really exciting because it's one of those things about filmmaking that you'd have no idea how you're going to pull something off. And then, you know, you all sit together in a room and, and then you kind of like talk it out and figure out how you're going to approach it. But um, yeah, the, the, the prologue of the movie from the very beginning, you know, we really wanted the pacing to feel different than the rest of the movie, which is very much 
you know, sort of, you can't catch your breath once the movie starts and it's over before you realize, cause it's just, you know, they're constantly on the move. So that the prologue was just a very much more sort of medolic pace. Yeah, it, it's interesting cause um, you were talking about the per being in there and their perspective with them and the kids are really the centerpiece of this. They really sort of come into their own, become adults. Um, and a lot of the way you uh, frame things really puts you down on their level. What were your tactics just to get that across and get us, you know, at their point of view? Um, well, thank you so much for saying that because, um, you know, it's, it's funny. I think inherently it just kind of comes from the fact that we were inspired by Steven Spielberg when we made this movie. You know, John is um, a massive fan. Um, and I think Steven Spielberg from his very first movies, you know, the way that he dealt with kids from E.T. And, and all the way through his career, he's really been able to take the viewer back into that experience of being a child. Um, and I think actually it was probably more of a subconscious thing that, that we did, that we were always maybe with their level or being, you know, wider and closer and, and moving with them and, and kind of experiencing the world alongside them. Um, but it's probably just just by being inspired by Stephen. <laughs> That's a good place to go for inspiration, I would <laughs> say. <laughs> and this film is probably, you know, when you think of all those action set pieces that are in there, it's probably one of the biggest films you've done to date. Is it daunting to sort of look at a page and go, oh my God, how complicated is, it? is this going to be? How do I put this together? Yeah, I mean, it was incredibly daunting. Um, I had so many tools and tricks and, you know, different ways to try and capture the movement, you know, mainly because when people are running full pelt, it's, it's really a challenge to get the camera to keep up with them and, and shoot it in a way that makes you feel like you're with them, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, that was definitely a challenge, but I was excited, you know, I think um, the movie, like I said, it just leaped off the page and, it also made me really appreciate the smaller scenes, the quieter scenes with the actors, because yes, action is exciting and you have to kind of figure it out, but um, that then contrasting with the, the really intimate family drama of it, which I think made, you know, that's what made the movie really special. Yeah, I think, I think that's one of the reasons why people resonate with the movie is there's such an emotional core to it. Mm -hmm. how, how do you have to sort of switch up your approach to a scene like that when it is softer and, and quieter and intimate? Um, I mean, it's really all about the camera, you know, and I think it's just, you know, sort of <clears throat> contrasting the, the really fast movement and the dynamic camera to, you know, just being still with the camera and just letting the performance speak for itself. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, at times, obviously, there's like visual punctuation, you know, with some camera movement, whether it's a a reveal or a push in or something um, to sort of highlight the emotional feat of it. But yeah, it's just as far as sort of like sculpting the light and making it feel intimate and then maybe being really subtle with the camera, you know, mm -hmm. so that everybody is just all eyes on, on the performance. And probably one, um, you know, sort of scene or a few scenes that combine, I think the intimacy and intensity is those moments where there's many of them where they're inside a furnace down in that uh, in that bunker. And it seems like a crazy place to shoot a scene. Uh, how did you construct those sequences shooting in such a small space? You know, um, you know, it's it's funny you say about the, the bigness of the movie and how it was the biggest thing I did to date. Well, the most challenging part of the movie was actually shooting in that tiny confined environment um, and in prep you know Jess Concha the wonderful production designer he he designed this furnace and you know it was a decent shootable size and John was like no no it's got to be smaller so he made another one and then still that was too big and so we ended up with this tiny little tube um, and you know the way that John really wanted to do it is he wanted to not have flyaway pieces but to just be able to pull the camera back from the door and then you know through the door to them when they were at the back. So we really had this set piece where we took the back and the front off and that was how we shot it. Um, so it meant it was very difficult to hide any light sources in there. Um, and because we were shooting on film, you know, it was scary to sort of expose deep down in, in the curve um, of the toes. So, you know, it's, uh, 
definitely challenging but um you know I, I often think gosh would I have done that differently you know if I got to do that again like how would I do it differently but um yeah it definitely you know needed to feel confined like that yeah and the light source there is probably uh, I think just you know on screen it's just candles one of the um places I really appreciated the lighting was in that final showdown between Millicent Simmons and the creature in the radio station, there's a great use of different light fixtures in there. What was your sort of overall approach to that space? Yeah, well, you know, again, just back in the script, it really talked about um, the on-air sign and kind of how that was this um, connection to the, the world at large. And I think that was sort of the overriding feeling of that space was that this was their last chance to, you know, try and just destroy the, the creatures and, and just reach um, anybody else that was out there. So we really made that our, our primary light source. And I think the contrast to the very naturalistic approach of the lighting through the whole movie, and then to suddenly be in a place with electricity um, and, you know, just be able to embrace a bit of color and, and the difference between the post-apocalyptic world that, you know, we'd gotten used to and now suddenly there's this glimpse of, of hope and, and the modern world. So um, it was a really nice chance to, to add some color in there. Yeah, would you say though, what's sort of a bigger challenge for you? Is it working within a space where you have to sort of design an interior lighting setup like that or working in the many outdoor environments and trying to capture light out there? Oh, I mean, I think a controlled environment is probably, always easier. Um, I think trying to control daylight in the middle of the day and try and make it look beautiful and not very harsh and, and top lit sort of in the middle of the day is constantly a challenge. Um, somehow, you know, you always kind of skirt around it and, and figure out a way of, of not um, making people look horrible. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that but I don't know, they all are so different, you know, and I think it's, um, it's again, a lot to do with time. You know, I think that all of the scenarios can be challenging if you don't have the right amount of time mm. to make it look the way that you want. Yeah. Well, um, you know, looking at the broader scope of your work, you have a resume that's besides a quiet place filled with lots of very intimate movies, but then you also, I mean, I probably best know you from, the show Legion, which is like incredibly visually audacious um, and such a visual spectacle. So is there a certain place or a, a style uh, that you're drawn to that you want to work in more? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I think I started off and I really was very much always drawn to just the intimate dramas um, and just, you know, the emotional stories that I could really, you know, help to supplement with the camera and lighting you know just to really help punctuate the performance and then you know when I got offered Legion it was just such a freeing creative amazing experience where the scripts were just bonkers and we could really just be as creative as we wanted you know um so that just kind of opened up you know sort of new ideas and thoughts and sort of things in my mind and I just you know have now now I've done a quiet place and I've done a lot of action and then I have done since then like a, a sort of a more drama piece and now I'm on another like bigger action movie um and I know that when I finish this movie what I really want to do is I want to go do a small indie drama <laughs> <laughs> because I think that you know I like doing everything it all just depends on the script and um and the director of course um but I think it's good to balance between you know the bigger stuff which are always just a bit crazy and you're more of a like you know conductor of all the different departments and crews and everything um to doing something a bit smaller where you know it's just you the director and the actor right in front of you yeah. well we'll hope you find that uh that nice indie drama for you it was <laughs> it was great sitting down to talk to you polly um, everyone who's out there watching make sure you subscribe to gold derby there are plenty more videos like this throughout the season Polly, thanks again. It was great to meet you. You too. Take care, Sam.